Thank you, Julie, very much. Um, it's an honor to introduce Peter Bentley. He's a remarkable, distinguished sound mixer and film producer. He dabbles in music and is a worldwide traveler and produces documentaries from around the country and the world. And I think he might be showing a travel clip today that he produced. Peter and his wife, Pat, of 53 years, um, they are, she's here with him today, and they have three children and um, some grandchildren. Some are younger, some are older. Um, Peter was born in Canada, and you'll hear his accent, it's beautiful. Pat was born in the UK, and they've lived uh, a lot of different places, various places in Canada and the United States, and of course it, a lot of it was depending on his work locations. Um, they currently live in the Bradenton, Sarasota area. Many of you may remember the show Mad Men, which is one of his most known film filmography jobs that he and the films were, the, they were given um, Emmy nominations and I'd like to read you from um, uh, 19 or 2017 Emmy News. And the question was, what would it feel like to have this Emmy nomination turn, turn into a win? And Peter said, when I was nominated for the HBO show Weapons of Mass Destruction, we were still in the analog Nagra days. For any sound mixer, winning is the cream of the crop. It's something that we would all like to have happen in our careers. For me, it would really be nice to share this with my colleagues, family, and friends. He is noted for Primetime Emmy Awards, Cinema Audio Society USA Awards, and Motion Picture Sound Editor Awards in the US. He's going to give us today a small glimpse of his work and how he got to the status of a high level sound mixer and film producer. Please help me welcome Peter Bentley. Wow, this is, an, this is an incredible audience. Usually it's my family with the kids. They say that. I heard that story before, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> uh, secondly, I would really like to thank the, all the ladies organizing this event from the library. I think they're doing an incredible job. So let's get them to <laughs> And before I start, um, my wife, Trish, and I, we just came back from Australia a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And our hearts go out to all the people there, the animals. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I get a little emotional sometimes, but when you have polar bears and when you feed uh, kangaroos, over 500,000 animals have perished. We don't know why so many people are in jail if they're starting the fires, but our hearts go on. Okay, now let's go on a lighter note. Um, just before I went in, my wife told me, don't tell everybody how old you are. <laughs> so the only thing I can say, I was born in 1940, <laughs> right at the start when the first bombs were dropped in Amsterdam or Rotterdam. So through my early years, I remember the end of the war, and um, my mom and dad had a pastry shop. Um, my dad was very fortunate to be one of the pastry makers that made the wedding cake for Queen Julia and Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. So. During my younger years, I was brought up in the sweetness, chocolate, <laughs> pastry, and sugars. So I hated two things in life, my younger life. One was sweets, and the second one was high school. <laughs> um, we had to learn four languages, and algebra, and all the other things that a lot of people are not interested in. And I, as a youngster, started really early in the technical, building amplifiers, radios, and uh, I'm an only child, was born in the later part of life. So, 
When I finished high school, I had an opportunity to go to flight school and took a two-year training course as a young flight engineer, where I was able to really play with all the toys that I played with before and got to know aircraft and instrumentation and all the technical aspects. Um, then I was lucky enough to spend two and a half years in the Dutch Navy, of which the last six months I uh, did some flying on one of the carriers, which brought me to two missions, one to Norfolk, Virginia, and one to the Caribbean. Um, that was one mistake for Holland because I fell in love with the US and I fell in love with Aruba and Curacao, so I had to make a decision if I wanted to immigrate, which country to go to. I wrote back, I had my first uh, scotch and ginger. <laughs> and um, Virginia had my first American beer. <laughs> so I decided to, yeah. to uh, find out about some immigration work. I flew for one year at a local smaller airport out of Rotterdam, but um, the North America was really attracted to me to move down to. So um, they accepted me. Um, I invited myself to this beautiful country. They didn't invite me, but I invited me, which I always should remember. So uh, when I got in, um, when I got into Holland, into, uh, when I, I was born in Holland, uh, when I immigrated to Canada, I found a job very quickly with a local television and radio repair shop. In those days, television sets were repaired, radios were repaired, yeah. toasters were repaired, it was not a throughout society. Yeah. Um, my younger years became very helpful when it came to fixing certain things. Uh, after about six months I became very bored and I wanted to do something different. And then a friend of mine worked for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the CBC in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And um, he showed me around. The next day, I went back to the front door, through the front door, and a couple of days later, I had a job. I started in television, master control, some camera work, some sound work, but next to the building was a radio station where uh, I had some recording studios, and I really, really was interested in doing some work with the um, the sound department in the radio department rather than the, the television end. Um, I applied for a transfer, I got the job, and I started to, I started off first in the technical end, and then later on I started to produce records and the radio drama. Now radio drama is very much involved with sound effects. It's, it's a story by radio, that is like a motion picture and radio all together. You know, when you're listening to the radio, you have to imagine that you are uh, working that it is like a movie. I did it for about four years, and then when I started to produce um, records, in the meantime, I made contacts with uh, people in Los Angeles. I took a course at Brigham Young for um, uh, radio engineering and management, and um, that brought me the introduction to what Hollywood's all about. Uh, I was very fortunate to uh, meet people like Herb Albert and uh, Richard Carpenter um, who worked out of the old Charlie Chaplin Studios on La Brea, which was one of the top big recording studios and film studios in Hollywood at that time. So when I met one of the gentlemen, when he says, listen, he says, if you ever want to build a studio in Canada, I can get you to the right people to help you out. So I got to my wife, she says, follow your dreams. And uh, I found some money through the Canadian government and some people out of Japan. And we constructed the first big motion picture a recording studio, West of Winnipeg, um, which lasted for about 17 years, which was quite an experience to um, being a young engineer, you know, never really produced big records to go through this whole building of studios, how the, the inners, where it was working. In Calgary, there was not a technical department, so I had to fly back and forth to uh, Los Angeles quite often to um, 
get to know the people that are building the particular studios and how it was done. So after about six months, we were able to get most of the work done and started to get our first group into the studio. Um, the one problem we had, Calgary sometimes gets 40 below zero. <laughs> and when you're an artist, you have an option. Do I record in Los Angeles or do I record in Calgary? <laughs> Spring was fine, fall was fine, uh, in between. We really had to hustle. Um, it was a great experience until the time came that analog started to go away and digital slowly. The techno, you know, we were caught up in the, the technical change, how the whole industry started to go. I could not raise the capital to rebuild our studios and analog to, to digital. So basically the only um, answer that was we had to close down the company. We had about 12 people working for us at that time. And um, we had to move. We could not afford to live in Calgary anymore. Calgary was too expensive. Even before that time, we had a beautiful house looking out on the prairies and the mountains, and it was all gone. So we moved to Vancouver Island, and I was jobless. Really didn't know what to do. Um, I had still a couple of uh, one particular artist on the contract. Um, I found her when she was about 12 years old at the high school, an incredible singer, Roxanne Goldie. And I was able to work with her for about five years and got her all up to Canada's most outstanding female vocalist for the Juno Award in Toronto. <coughs> but having no studio anymore, I had no ways of, of uh, working with her out of different studios because <coughs> the cost became too uh, prohibitive of, of continuing that. Um, during my years at CBC, I met an incredible gentleman by the name of Bob Gibson. He was a pilot and also a cameraman. And he introduced me to the making of documentaries. Now in the early days, a documentary was made by three people, a director, the cameraman, and the sound mixer. Um, the director gave the orders, the cameraman followed the orders, and the sound mixer did all three. <laughs> including uh, getting coffee, <laughs> including making booking arrangements for flights, including loading filming cameras. Uh, also, there was never money in the budget for a second cameraman, so it was the sound mixer that took the second camera and shot B footage, and that's the way we traveled. We traveled in both airplane, flew all across Canada, doing documentaries, commercials, Carlsberg, Toyota, you, you know, I've seen them all. But there was one piece of equipment we had, which was the Niagara. The Niagara was a, a piece of, you know, 15 pounds of equipment that was over your shoulders, with reel to reel. Then we closed down the studio. I had one in the studio because we, about it, we also developed in a complete um, motion picture mixing department mm -hmm. where um, we did all the original scoring for. Uh, uh, Paul Newman's Buffalo Bill and the Indians. We got, the, the studio was large enough that we could have a full, you know, we could have like a 60-piece orchestra right in the studio. So when we closed down the studio, I kept that piece of equipment. And that saved my life. Um, so a friend of mine at the time was an editor. And he says, Peter, he says, I'm doing a picture, a motion picture, a big picture. It's always a big picture, you know, in Vancouver, Canada, and the picture was called Big Meat Eater. Big Meat Eater. Um, there were only two scripts, one for the script supervisor and one for the director. So I said, what's the picture all about? And he says, Peter, I don't know. <laughs> you have a microphone, you have a recorder, you have some tape, you know, let him speak, and you get it. And it was really a very big picture because especially there was no money. Um, my paycheck was lunch, was gasoline, and a beer afterwards. <laughs> and I did that like for four weeks. Sometimes it was a nice lunch. <laughs> uh, 
the money, I, I remember one scene where we had a meat counter and there was enough money to buy one side of beef. And the pig meter was the, the big butcher. I, I, I will not go into the story, but I'll just explain what happened to the beef. The beef, no, no, the beef, the beef was fresh when we bought it. When big lives for 15 hours are on the beef, for the first day, it still looks red. So we left the freezers on, we went to bed for a few hours, we came back the next day, there was a slight odor in the room. We could not move the meat at that time. So we filmed the next day and the smell was getting a little worse. So we found a butcher that was willing the second night to take that beef and put it somewhere in the freezer. After the third day, he refused to get the beef back. So one of the makeup girls said, Priya, how about I have some, some spray that smells good. Let's, let's smell it on the beef. Let's, let's spray it on the beef. Let's do that. So we worked it out a few days. Uh, to make a long story short, the last day or so it was like a deep breath, running, roll cameras, action, blah, 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 walk out. <laughs> How we got rid of the beef, I don't know. I was on something else. But that film got me actually starting to move into Los Angeles. Um, Richard, who was an editor at that time, um, after that movie, we also moved to Los Angeles, and, and uh, we were able to get on some, to work on some very low, low budget. You know, LA, it's a great town, but um, they're also very, they're looking after the dollars and cents. So, um, there were several weeks that there was no money. Um, I had a bowl of water, and I moved from couch to couch to couch to couch. There are a lot of couches in Hollywood. Not the other couches, but regular couches. <laughs> where, uh, you know, you met friends in the very, I don't know, a place to stay. Okay, we can stay here. My wife was still in the family living in Canada. Um, so all of a sudden I had the opportunity to do one paying picture. And I sent the money to Canada, to, uh, to Canada and I remember playing Monopoly and my son at the bank. <laughs> and I said, Gary, here's the money. And we played him up with the money. Yeah. <laughs> I was sitting in my hotel room that night and everything in those days was cash. And it was like, I threw it up in the air and it was like, you know, the green stuff came rolling down. And they asked me, would you like to do another day? And I said, how many days do you have? Um, Hollywood has, has changed over all the years. I came in in kind of the middle, but when Hollywood was, you know, when Hollywood started, um, we had the major studios like Paramount and Warner Brothers, uh, MGM, and the actors like um, um, Hogan, you know, Colonel, you know, Tom, um, Colson Dickens. They all belong to each studio. So Sinatra would work for this studio, and uh, Marlon Brando would work for that studio. So there was competition, but it was a big family. And in those days, they would be training all the actors how to ride horses, how to shoot guns. The ones that could dance a little bit, they would get dancing lessons, they could sing lessons. So that when you're watching the old movies, you can see that they were playing you know, different roles, but they were acting as they were taught. That is not happening today anymore. All our actors are all freelance. Uh, the studios are getting less power, and companies like HBO and Netflix are really taking over the industry. Um, when even towards the end of my time when I started, to do a motion picture, it was shot on film. In the, let me go back a little bit. In the early days, you, many people have asked me question, Peter, the early movies, why did they all sound so good? You could hear the actors, you know, it was all great. Filmmaking was done differently. 
the actors were doing a scene on stage, and everything was done on beautiful, insulated, and well constructed sound stages in Hollywood. So they would do a scene, as, and the equipment was very, very um, uh, not as good as it is today. So as soon as the actor did the scene, they were taken to a looping stage. And the scene was still in their mind. Then they would cut the audio portion and they would put it on a loop. They would glue it together and would go over rollers. And they would put three beeps in front. So the actor would hear beep, beep, beep. Then his spoken words on stage, which were very low in level and you know not perfect. And he would be closed by for a mic in front of a microphone. And he would repeat that line over and over and over until it was exactly the way it was with the film. Then they would cut that soundtrack and they would put that in by the film. Am I going too fast? No. So that's where the word looping, you know, looping states and looping uh, came all about. And that's the same with. The sound effects in those days, they had cocktail bars, they had people, uh, Foley and ADR groups that would walk on gravel. So they would watch the picture and then there would be a whole row of shoes, high heels, medium heels, thick heels, running shoes, gravel, concrete, sand, tar, you call it, whatever. So they would watch the picture and then if there were three people walking on the gravel, they would go. It always sounded crisp because in the early days when, you know, the camera, uh, for anybody here that, that plays in photography a little bit, like on a 25 millimeter lens, and you see the world, those microphones were so high up, they didn't have wireless like we have now, that the sound was very weak and, and not, you know, you know, not the way he wanted to hear. So gravel footsteps would not penetrate as much as we wanted to hear. So the Foley group would walk on, on the stones, watch the movie, and that also would be cut in. So we could have like 25 tracks of sound and one track of picture. When the movie industry started, we had a First of all, we had only picture. And the orchestra playing, this was before my time. <laughs> this was before I did Ben-Hur. <laughs> so they had piano players, they had orchestration playing to the movie. Then finally, when sound came in, that was a whole new division in Hollywood. That was the latest. So the people that started to work in the industry, we had a film director and we had a sound director. And there were times that the sound director got more priority to the film director because sound really is putting the film together. And I always, you know, when I had sometimes some, not arguments, but discussions with directors that I always said, let's make it a 50-50 split. Sometimes your film is 99% and my sound is 1%, and there are times that I'm 99% and you're 1%. Um, one little story I once heard on, uh, on a rap party for a show, and the uh, DP, the cameraman, he and I didn't, I, I get along with a lot of people in LA, but there was one guy that we, I didn't get along. We were fighting very well for 12 weeks. Uh, and sound was nothing, and sound was nothing, and sound was nothing. So we are at the rap party, and he is standing, we're standing maybe six, seven people in the group having a drink. And I said to him, I said, I don't mention his name, I said, skip me, I said, do you fly? Do you get on an airplane sometimes? Said, of course I do. He says, I fly first class. I said, it's good for you. I said, do you watch a movie? He said, yes, of course I watch a movie. I said, remember one thing, the movie is for free, but you pay five dollars for your headphones. <laughs> <laughs> I went that way. <laughs> and he went that way. Um, so, um, when Hollywood started to change, um, 
Uh, so did the industry. You know, um, more things went to computers. Let me come back one, one more the, the The making of a movie, um, there are a lot of people involved. Like Mad Men, we had about 200 people on the crew. And they were not all on the set, there were all the people behind the sets. But it all starts with a script. Um, then we see a script, and the script is broken down um, by uh, our department, by script supervisor, and by the production manager. And it is broken down in sections. You have to understand you see day and you see night. And there is a time frame that you can work only, we work 15 hours a day on that moment. Um, we have 75 hour weeks. So when I hear somebody working nine hours, I'll say, I'll show you, you know, that you know, more than nine hours. So a script has to be broken down. And in the early days, it was broken down. We had a big a book that had like four different sections. Was, each section was about this big. And they had strips in it. And they had colored strips white, blue, purple, green, and yellow, whatever. And white was for day for day. And then blue was night for night. So the scenes we could show, we could shoot in the day was marked and all the information was on that strip. So everybody on the set could look at the book and could find out for props, for sound, for camera, for makeup, for hair, who was in that scene, what time it was done, because that was white, that was day. Then blue was if it was night. There was something called day for night that we would shoot in the daytime, a night scene on stage. And we would shoot night scenes in daytime where we would light scenes for night for day. Wow. Uh, so it was a very complicated, when you look at it the first time, but um, it gave us all the information when and how this is all being built. Um, I did a picture when we talk about night today, and I'll explain this a little bit. I did uh, Reese Wetherspoon's first movie called Man in the Moon. Has anybody seen Man in the Moon? <laughs> One time, you know, I, I, you know, six months ago. <laughs> One time ago. It's uh, her first movie, and my director at that time was Bob Mulligan. And Bob Mulligan was a director that did uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Beautiful, beautiful picture. And his DP, his cameraman, was a British person called um, Ray Francis. Thank you. And uh, we were shooting like for three weeks all day, 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 day. And now we go into night because there's a scene where Reese Weatherspoon has to swim in a small lake at night. So we're starting at five o'clock in the afternoon, and by about 11, 12 o'clock at night, um, the director, Bob Mulligan, goes to Freddie and says, Freddie, you know, um, do you really like working at night? And Freddie, in his British language, no, no, sir, no, no, I, I, I want to work during the daytime. And Bob Mulligan says, do you know anybody or somebody that has a technique that we can shoot in the day and it looks nighttime? And Freddy says, indeed, I know somebody. And he was the master in shooting night for day. So Bob, uh, uh, the director, Bob Mulligan, goes to the, uh, one of the producers and he says, just tell the boys and girls, go to bed. And we will start like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because like we have an eight-hour turnaround. Um, and the, you know, the producer. Do this, you know, I mean, this is booked and we have caterers and you know and the toilet man is coming at six o'clock and this and that and so says, you want to speak English? Yeah. Um, we started the next day at two o'clock and if you remember that scene where the recent little boy swimming in the pool it was all done during the day huge lights um, uh, so it was a little bit of a power trip, but the power trip got executed. And uh, there is a lot of power, uh, there is a lot of rank 
you know, in the movie industry. You know? They have the studios that sit in the, they sit in the chairs and you know they shovel the money around. And then there's the middle end, and then there's the people that work on the set. And we are just we have been daily employees. If I would get my call sheet at two o'clock in the afternoon, first thing you look is your name on the call sheet. Because they have to let you know by two o'clock. If you're not on the call sheet, you're fired. Boy. So there's no notice, there is no conversation, nobody in the film industry gets holiday pay because we are all working day by day by day by day. So uh, if you complain, <laughs> there are too many boys and girls that are interested in, in taking over the job. Um, I'm just going back and forth a little bit. On Mad Men, my my day would start at seven o'clock on Monday mornings, and we would work till nine o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. With all the trimmings, we had three meals. Uh, it's a miniature world. The catering, fantastic. We had food trucks. You want eggs Benedict? You want salmon in the morning? Whatever. Lunchtime, all the meals. At night, all the meals. Cappuccinos, espressos. Um, coffee was a big thing. Keep everybody awake. So. I would get home and I would there. We lived at that time close down town. So I was very fortunate. Some people had to drive an hour, an hour and a half to get home. A lot of people slept in cars. Uh, nine o'clock, so nine o'clock was end of the day. Then the next morning, we would start on Tuesdays, we would start at nine o'clock in the morning <coughs> till midnight. This is not Tuesday midnight. Then on Wednesdays, we would start at, mid at noon till two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. Then Thursdays, we would start at whatever. On Fridays, I would go to work at five o'clock in the evening till seven o'clock in the morning when my wife woke up and I was ready to, she was ready to get me a cup of coffee and breakfast because that time I would not eat breakfast at I said, I'd rather would have it with her. Um, then you want some sleep, and she never knew this, but I would take an ambient, <laughs> and I would sleep for a few hours, and then you are go for dinner on Saturday night, and then Sunday she's a little miserable, <coughs> because at 5 o'clock you have to get up again and start your work at 7 o'clock in the morning. So, and that is still going on. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, an, it's a beautiful industry. But uh, the word complaining is not on our list. Complainers are gone. And everybody in the film industry lives with one word. What do you think it is? One word that is the most important word, word when you work in the industry. No? 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 The word is fear. Oh. How many people here have two alarm clocks to wake you up in the morning? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Afraid of sleeping through one o'clock and not showing up in time. Because when one department isn't there, you know, the industry shuts. The industry stops. Um, but it's it's an industry that that is is very rewarding when you start it, you start a movie and usually the shows in it are like you know 10 12 14 weeks and then three or four months later you see that movie in uh, a screening with all your friends and some cocktails and everything else and you see it on the big screen and you see it there. Yeah, it's, it's 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 very rewarding it's uh you know, a lot of other professions, you can do a great job. And, you know, for instance, you a great plumber with plumbing in the house, and he gets paid and beautiful, he's the best, he walks away, you might never see that house again. You know, we still can see it on Netflix, and we still can still see it on now. Um, so when, when the, the old industry of the analog started to leave Hollywood, um, 
a lot of smaller companies started to infiltrate the industry. <coughs> and it came to do a little bit money and locations and unions. And I'm not here to have a discussion about union, yes versus no. I leave that, you know, totally up. I'm not a spokesperson for any union organization, but um, I had an opportunity to uh, work for Andy Griffith, the Andy Griffith Show, um, Matlock in Wilmington, North Carolina. And we were living that time in Los Angeles. Uh, a lot of movies started to drift away from LA because of the cost, and yes, the cost was getting very, very expensive. For instance, um, if we would shoot outside, on the outside the stage, we were driving shots. We needed four policemen, and the policemen that were retired police officers made sixty-five dollars an hour on their motorcycles, and it was all cash money. So it was two hundred and sixty dollars an hour for four cops, while in New York they were for free. They were part of the police department. And they didn't have cops in Wilmington, North Carolina, but they had police cruisers that didn't do the exact way job like the L, because the LA Motor Cops are still, you know, one of the finest in the movie industry of, of controlling us safely uh, throughout, uh, throughout the streets. But the cost became, uh, it was for the producers cheaper to go, they wanted to get a little cheaper, the movies made a little cheaper, and they went to um, North Carolina. And especially to Wilmington. Uh, at one time we had six pictures shooting in Wilmington more than we had shooting in Los Angeles. And I saw the, the, the growing of Wilmington as a, as a little mini movie capital. But there were, there were many moments that um, I was involved in helping to build the film commission in Raleigh uh, with Bill Arnold. Uh, to get a film commission going, and also a film commission going in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I experienced once where there was an electrician that was on a ladder doing some work, and he fell off, and he was transported to the hospital, and his name was not on the call sheet the next day. He was insured until he fell that day, and that was it. So. Uh, being part of a, a, a local organization called uh, Cape Fear Filmmaker Support, which is a non-profit and non-political, uh, we had a lot of, we were raising money through the community to promote the, the Wilmington film industry. So we we called, I actually I called the meeting, and <coughs> even I was fine because I still worked under my LA contract. So my medical was covered, but my friend that fell off the ladder wasn't. And I think I felt that something had to be done there. So we put a group together and um, uh, I did a picture with Lindsay Wagner and we tried to, uh, we talked to her and we put an HMO together that for a week before and two weeks after the film was over, the people on the set were being covered. And it was like a $40,000 bill out of a $2 million picture. And Lindsay, the producers were totally against it. Lindsay was willing to go with it. Um, it became so bad that it got shut down and uh, the New York Union came in and the picture was totally at a standstill. Um, to make a long story short, the HMO is now in place in Wilmington, and there are three different contracts in Wilmington where filmmakers can work as low as seventeen dollars an hour. Um, paychecks still on the call sheet. You still can get fired the next day. So with, with HBO, HBO was the first one that uh, the unions gave HBO a blanket contract. It will give you two years that you can make your movies totally, pay the guys $5 an hour, whatever you want to pay them. If you become successful at HBO after two years, then we should make sure that everybody gets a fair wage. That lasted about six years. And finally, you know, HBO went with a decent contract, and so with Netflix. The only one that isn't yet is, is Hallmark. They're still 
flying a little bit under the wire. But um, you know, you have to look at it. How much, how much money is also wasted in the industry? That the workers that make the picture, they're saying, you know, all we want is a fair share. You know, you can live. I don't blame anybody living in Malibu in the twenty million dollar homes, and I don't care for the actors to make twenty five million dollars a picture. They they can make fifty million dollars a picture. I don't care. But at least the people that make the movies, we all do it together. Craft service to me is as important as Steven Spielberg. You know, we all need each other, you know, to to make this play. So uh, that's where we and, and I'm glad because I'm a, right now I have a good I have a good medical program and I get a little bit of pension and and you know, we work for it and uh, I think the movie industry will never go broke. So, uh, um, so to go back a little bit to the editing, the same with sound editing, the same was done with the early years of picture editing. Uh, we would shoot film, and then the picture editor, and this was all, all done on mechanical equipment, the film would be on big platters, and they would literally cut the frame. Next time you watch a movie, watch say for five minutes how many times you see the picture change sometimes it can be every two seconds that is a cut we call it but literally a cut is made and it can be filmed at different times we can do the closing scene first day of the show we can do the middle scene at the end of the show so nothing is being shot in sequence it is all done depending again on day and night availability of the actors. Um, so when when the, the film editor gets the film, he starts cutting it with, in the old days, with a piece of equipment, bit wheels, and literally with a cutter, and would cut the 35 mil solenoid, yeah. take a piece, take a piece, has a little pencil with glue, glue the film, a little splicer, count to five, Boom, next frame. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. When he needed a certain portion double, he had a telephone, he would call the laboratory and said, roll 29, scene 24, take 45, I need seven frames, blah, blah, blah. X number 2972. The lab would print that piece of film. A driver would take it back to the editor, he would get it a day later. And he had a piece of film and he could cut it in. All the effects were done by special effects people. Steam, smoke, um, explosions, um, animals, everything was done, you know, by order, one at a time. Those days are gone. Um, when I started to uh, we knew Batman was going to be five years. It lasted eight years. Um, after the second year, I was able to get in contact with them, uh, two travel companies, one out of um, Australia, one out of China, uh, to do some travel films. And But I had to deliver a complete package, which was shoot it, direct it, produce it, edit it, do sound effects, put smoke in. Thank God there is a program called Apple. <laughs> and thank God there is a program called Final Cut Pro. All the things that were done in the early years, the way I just explained it, are now all done in my office. I can put smoke in the film, we do the editing, and the edit is just Apple B, cut, boom, it's in. So you could not do, uh, you could not, I could not have done my travel shows uh, the way I had to work in my first documentary. And um, there's no director. I directed, I produced it, I shoot it. So a three man crew became a one man crew. And Australia liked it, and China liked it. Then uh, one little quick story uh, for the Australian travel clips. We needed a narrator, 
and they wanted somebody that spoke a little like English Australian. And I said to my wife, I said, can you speak a little Australian English? She said, indeed. <laughs> I said, you're hired. <laughs> and so we were, that time we were still living in Los Angeles, and so I do a little clip, and I recorded her voice, and said, wow, where is this woman from? Where, where did you find this actress? And I said, she's from Hollywood, but I cannot tell you who she is. <laughs> so we did a couple of shows, and it all worked out great, until the manager of Intrepid, who was based on Petaluma, and we had to call about something, so Pat says, let me, let me call the office and, and talk to him. And I was like, wow, your voice sounds familiar. Are you the, are you the, are you the, are you the Hollywood actress? And so, so the ice was broken. Oh, yeah. So uh, I'll show you a little clip of, um, of Galapagos. Um, I don't know how much time we have, I, I can, Go on. Um, do you want to open it up to questions, or do you want to see a little video? Video. 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 Uh, even that all the other water stuff I shot and uh, the GoPro that you could do 25 years ago. And I was told, before I started by our our guide, Peter, you have to promise me you have to keep your distance. You have to keep your distance 12 feet from the animals. So there is the animal and I kept my distance. But the animal didn't. <laughs> so instead of me going to the animal, the animal came to me. You know, so let me. Uh... Okay. Of this enchanting land, 
we see many of the native birds take flight as we pass. Kicker Rock, also known as Leon Dormido or the Sleeping Lion, is two towering rocks protruding 500 feet from the ocean, and they give witness to its ancient volcanic origin. <laughs> Ask it or explain the origin of these rocky outcrops as we prepare to explore the rocks from below. We don snorkeling gear and over the side. Swimming through one of the narrow crevasses, we come across a family of sharks. These guys are the harmless type and just cruise along. As we board to go back, we're treated to a brief but beautiful ballet by two local residents. We all take in the sounds of the waves and the tranquility. It is a natural theme here. On this island, we see the local inhabitants, the scaly ones gathering to watch their flesh and blood and the beach. Yeah. Good idea. Let's take a break, have a cool drink, as old Snowtop observes us as well. <laughs> Pleasant evening with our travel friends, 
was finished off with dinner on the town square, being entertained by local talent. <laughs> Beach. 
we're told in no uncertain terms that these benches were made for us sea lions. Please sit elsewhere. <laughs> This glorious beach is also a paradise for the big ones. The next morning we prepare for an early kayak excursion. Kayaking 101. On the beautiful clear waters, we kayak together as a group exploring still more wildlife in their natural habitat. Next, we're off to Santa Cruz Island. And as you can see, this island hopping is busy stuff. <laughs> it was a glorious sunrise and we were off to the fish market. to anticipate the return of the morning's fish catch. <laughs> the pelicans can hide their time knowing the treats are coming. <laughs> How about a piece of that beautiful tuna, Charlie? Thanks, I think I'll take it right home to the kids. <laughs> A short bus ride takes us to the fascinating lava tunnels. It's a little dark and a little eerie, but with the aid of our flashlights, we're able to see the sculptural marks left by the ancient lava flows. Some of the clips, um, they all can be released now if you go to YouTube. 
and book on my name, Peter. Okay. Then you will see a whole bunch. If you put uh, Peter Bentley Intrepid Travel or World Spree Travel, you get the kind of sit in the link. You can just see a whole bunch of them. You can watch it on the iPad or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Really good. So, Peter, um, were you self employed most of your career then? Since I was born. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then to get a pension, so that's from belonging to the union, then, that you had a pension. Would you were self employed? I, I had to, actually, it was a time that I had to join the union uh, to, keep on work, or to keep working in Hollywood. Peter, how long did it take you from beginning to end to do that? That? <laughs> it takes, the picture editing goes pretty quickly. All, a lot of this, because I have only one camera, and doing those documents, like with mo in the motion picture industry, we can do take 42. And the actors will hit the mark, and you do it over and over and over and over. Yeah. We're doing documentaries, you have one shot. You cannot ask the animal to turn around. <laughs> and, and do things. So, um, I don't know how many hours it takes me to do one minute, but it's like 20 hours or so to do a minute of finished film. It's the sound and the mixing, you know, to pull all the sound effects. It's, it, takes, it takes a long time. So, follow up to that then. How long on Mad Men? Uh, how many hours or minutes of uh, actual footage did you get for a 15 hour day? Um, we were shooting uh, 43 minutes in eight days. <laughs> and spent two and a half million dollars. Ooh. And they're making so much. <laughs> How did you deal with the actors that came in late when you had such a strict timetable? <laughs> we, we had to wait <laughs> and then work a little harder, sometimes work a little more past 15 hours. Um, it, it, it's difficult. I mean, it was, it was give and take. I remember doing a picture with Bert Reynolds in Las Vegas. And uh, we were scheduled for like 12 hours because we were shooting on the top of the Sands Hotel. And Bert hit his foot and was out of rotation for about an hour to see the medics. And we all went an hour longer and we didn't charge the government to court. You described logistically um, how you dubbed in people walking across gravel and all of that in the olden days. How would you do that for Mad Men? Uh, is it all done electronically? Is it just high tech stuff? Yeah, that I, I do. I have it on my computer. Um, I have folders of effects, and I type in footsteps, and I get a bar. Okay, footsteps. How many feet? Three. What kind of shoes? And there is a whole row of shoes. Um, High heels, how heavy the person, lady, gentleman, grapple, fine grapple, small grapple, um, concrete, whatever. So you, you type in all the parameters and then how fast. And then so you, you, you lay in, in, in the timeline, in your audio timeline, you say, okay, for seven seconds. And you lay it in, and then you look at it, and then you can reduce it and stretch it so it's all in sync. How do you do it for voices? Um, with voices, you can you can take a syllable. You can put in. You can make a single word plural by taking an S from somewhere else and splicing it out and laying it in. Oh, wow. Yeah. You can need all your files or the copy written with you. Those. Yeah. All the, the special effects that you just described. They, they are coming. They are okay. the sound. You know, like the sound library. I have uh, some of them I purchased. Um, I built up a whole sound effects library over the years, um, but there's not so much available online that you can purchase or that you can, you can have access to.
Uh, with the unionization, is that going to affect the pay schedule over time? Oh, yeah. But in fact, it seems to be better for the whole industry. Now, the, the reason um, we need to came out of the it has to do a little bit with what the showrunner wants to get out of his group. Like um, um, Clint, Eastwood, Clint, Clint Eastwood will work only eight hours and get it done. But he cannot get anybody to work for eight hours because you know the people can work 12 hours and make overtime after eight. So the company will pay 12 hours for eight hours of work. And he keeps his family. Uh, a good friend of mine worked with the sound mix and Walt Martin who passed away who never got the benefits of his pension or you know he died very young. Um, so they, um, they compensate you for money. So you're crazy enough to work the hours, but I I enjoy it. I mean, I, I, my department, uh, like at seven o'clock, we would start work, and you have a rehearsal, and it would take three hours before we roll film. I planned out the shots, what I needed for my department with my guys, and out of the three hours, it took us an hour to do it. Two hours, I could do whatever I wanted to do. So I did a lot of pre-production on the set. Um, I did uh, two cooking shows, one in uh, Tuscany and one in uh, uh, Thailand. And Robert Morse, who was one of the actors, he did all my narration. And we did it in the stairwell. I did all my off hours during that. And so we, I think we were the only department that had extra time. Cameras was always working and props were always working, etc. They had no, no time to go to the bathroom in my department. We had a little less of that. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for coming today. And I hope to see you all next Thursday.